So the recording started. So as I said earlier, we've got two fantastic speakers, which is Annalise from the Drone Office and Shemik uh, from Dronistics. And what I will ask the uh, the people in the audience is um, if you could turn off your um, uh, microphones and cameras, and I'll, I will do the same, and just allow the speaker to have their camera and microphone on. But as the speakers are going through their presentations, please put questions in the chat. And we've also got some nice comments going in the chat already, which is just brilliant. Um, and if there's one or two, I will just open up the microphones and you can directly ask your question at the end of the presentation. If we have quite a few questions, if you can give a thumbs up if you like that question, then I'll give the priority to the questions with the majority of the thumbs up. And if we don't quite get through all of the questions, then I would forward them on to the speakers. Okay. So without further ado, I think we've got Annalise, you're, you're first up, aren't you? Which is good. So I'm going to I'm going to release the the sharing of the screen, I think, which is good. Oh, no, I didn't quite do that, which is a shame. So do you want to take over the screen, Annalise? And sure, let me. Let me launch on my end. Here you go. Can you see the screen? We can see it fantastically. Yes. Well. OK, perfect. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Annelise at the uh, drone office. Uh, we are a consulting company specialized in uh, drones and uh, autonomous systems. And I must thank you, Paul, first for giving us the opportunity to, uh, you know, to talk at uh, one of the uh, DRACMA meetings. It's a, it's a great idea that uh, you are having of uh, putting us together. And I hope that uh, during the next um, a few minutes, I will be able to share of the key findings and that you will find it uh, useful for your own uh, activities. So we are going to talk uh, now about the standard operating procedures that we developed as part of Project Air Response. First, a few words about uh, Air Response. It's one of the 14 winning consortium as part of drone solutions for COVID-19. The objective is to pave the way for routine drone delivery operations between medical sites. Now, the consortium is led by a medical packaging company called Intelsius, and it brings together a mix of industrial companies with also HeroTech 8, sorry, drone in a box, Blue Bear, UAS systems, Intelsius and the drone office. And we also have uh, academics with King's College. Thank you, Paul. Cranfield University on the aerospace side. And in this consortium, we really had at heart to be as close as possible to real end users. And we were really lucky that we had on board Bedfordshire Hospitals, Milton Keynes University Hospital, and Milton Keynes Council Borough. So standard operating procedures. Why on earth did we uh, have uh, SOPs as part of the project? Well, actually, it's a very known and useful tool to achieve compliance, to achieve um, acceptance by the uh, practitioners, to achieve scalability, re repeatability, and quality, in a way, in the operations that are conducted. So we really try to develop, as part of Air Response, SOPs with and for real end users. In our scope, well, we started by discussing with the uh, hospital and medical teams and quickly we realized that each hospital had many ideas in terms of uh, uh, user cases and things to transport using uh, drones. So we did not focus on just one item. We looked at a range of items starting from simple you know, simple stuff. Uh, so unused PPE, test kits for COVID, but we also looked at uh, sensitive instruments and sterile surgical tools for the theater. We looked at pharmaceutical products and these, um, you know, the transport of pharmaceutical products in terms of regulations and compliance must follow the uh, good distribution practices under the oversight of the, of the MHRA, as I'll explain in a few moments. Also, pharmaceutical products may be toxic substances in terms of dangerous goods. However, there are ways around it. The first one is that 
pharmaceutical products or medicines that are transported in their packaging for distribution on, on, on the retail market, um, you know, are exempt uh, under the, um, it's called Special Provision 601 under ADR. It means that they do not have the transport of those uh, products, do not need to follow the entire uh, dangerous goods regulations. And also when you look at um, uh, the uh, regulation for dangerous goods by air, there is also a concept of accepted quantity. That is, if you transport pharmaceutical products that are uh, considered toxic, but in sufficient, sufficiently low uh, quantities, you do not need to follow the entire dangerous goods uh, regulation. Finally, we also looked at uh, blood samples. And actually, this was one of the most compelling user cases that came up with the uh, different teams and the different sets of hospitals. So the idea is to basically send blood samples or uh, uh, blood tissue, uh, human tissues so that we can quickly get the results back from the uh, test lab. And uh, that is particularly useful and relevant in emergency situations. Now, when it comes to biological samples, they are also considered as classified as dangerous goods, infectious substances, and there is no getaway around it. That is, there is no threshold, no matter what, um, uh, when you are when you have a uh, a sample that is uh, considered infectious, it has to the transport has to follow the DGR, as I will as I will explain in a few moments. In terms of uh, operations in our scope, we looked at point-to-point -point flight that is going from a known point A to a known point B. So from hospital to hospital or from hospital to care home or and way back. We also looked at fully autonomous and remotely controlled drone operations so that there is no need for a skilled UAS pilot on site. So takeoff and landing takes place of course, from a hospital site, but they are controlled remotely by a remote pilot, but he is or she is um, in, a, in a control center. Then we also uh, took into consideration uh, operations in what we call congested areas, or let's call it in plain English, urban environment, because even if we look at um, supporting a care home, for example, that is in rural uh, area, we still have to acknowledge that the hospitals are in city centres and therefore at least part of the flight uh, path will be over urban environment with more risk, if you want, on the ground than when you look at uh, flight trials in, in rural areas. So these three points of the scope are uh, key points when it comes to getting an authorization by the Civil Aviation Authority. We also looked in terms of operations at the two other um, elements that really uh, focused on the integration into the healthcare um, industry and healthcare environment. One is a digitized process and here we really wanted to develop a service that is very easy to use for the medical team so that it would be basically as simple as ordering a taxi ride or you know a food on your on your smartphone and we also considered you know end to end traceability because this is now a a key requirement for most medical products in the healthcare in the healthcare industry and we also looked at the requirement to interface with what we call global standard GS1, because this is a uh, barcode technology that is now implemented pretty much everywhere in the NHS and in many, many other um, hospital and healthcare environments around the world. So key findings. The first one is the um, compliance with the good distribution practices. So, so this is uh, in the UK under the oversight of the Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, MHRA. Uh, 
And if we look at, you know, a key principle, which is outlined here, regardless of the mode of transport, it should be possible to demonstrate that the medicines have not been exposed to conditions that may compromise their quality and integrity. So really, the objective is to make sure that after being transported, the, the medicine and the pharmaceutical product can be administered to patients safely. The implications are traceability, anti-tempering to make sure that no falsified medicine enters into the supply chain, temperature monitoring, the positive identification of the receivers and the shippers, so the shippers is a term for you know, the sender, uh, so uh, receivers and senders personnel, the suitability of the vehicle, here the drone, and the container, which can be the box containing the medical payload. And we have to assume that even though there is no regulation, of course, today when it comes to transporting medicines or pharmaceutical products using a drone, we can safely assume that the regulatory agencies will require some reassurance specific to drones. So, for example, proof by simulation or actual proper testing in real life um, that the temperature variations or temperature peaks, that the vibrations, that the acceleration would be within a uh, framework that would that would that is compatible with maintaining the quality of the product that is transported. Second point is the compliance with the dangerous goods regulation. It's important to understand that this requires a specific authorization by the Civil Aviation Authority dangerous goods team, a team that is different from the CAA UAS team. And so that team will require um, reassurance uh, before granting approval of transporting dangerous goods by drones. So that would typically cover uh, dangerous goods specific SOPs, a dangerous goods safety risk assessment, using packaging that is already in use for the transport of dangerous goods currently by air or by road, meeting specific uh, um, uh, testing and robustness uh, requirements. And it could be that the authorities will also uh, require uh, some simulation or tests in terms of spillage or leakage in case of emergency, emergency soft landing or even crash. Third item is the compliance with the UAS regulation. So you probably know quite a bit of uh, these regulations in a nutshell. Since uh, December 2020, we have a new set of regulation in the UK and in Europe with three categories of drone operations depending on the level of risk and what we want it to is to stay within the remit of the specific category that would require prior approval by the CAA uh, but within the specific category that is based on a risk assessment and not going over with too many risks and going to the certified category because that would put us in a in a different um, sphere altogether, referring back to a regulatory regime which is similar to manned aviation. So really, we want to remain within the specific category. And so that means that in terms of gaining approval under the drone regulation, we have to accept the fact that you need to go step by step in terms of risks. Uh, so an incremental approach where you de-risk the different uh, uh, risks of the operations from flight trials to routine operations. So I don't want to go too much into the different risks, but uh, the fact that the uh, pilot is not live on site is new you know, in a way for a, an aviation regulator who is used to having a pilot in charge and in command. So that's, a, you know, that's one area. The second area is the air-based risk, that is the risk that the uh, drone may uh, have a collision with another airspace user, which could be you know, a glider or another aircraft or any type of other airspace user. And um, um, currently in manned aviation, that role of detect and avoid other airspace users is performed by the pilot. And during takeoff and landing, it's also supported by the air traffic controllers at the airport. Now, it's a different uh, scenario when we are looking at uh, drone operations. 
Another type of risk is the uh, ground risk, that is the risk that uh, if uh, there is a technical failure or another un un unidentified um, or, or, or another risk, if you want, uh, that uh, the uh, drone may injure people or assets on the ground. And that is typically the case or an additional risk when you look at an urban environment because the density of uh, buildings and assets and people on the ground is higher. And then there are some other risks that must be taken into consideration as well when you have a complex environment. So you could lose communications because you have interferences or you have buildings so you have a more complex environment and all these different types of risks must be taken into consideration and de-risked on a step-by-step -step basis. Finally, it's important to also take into consideration operational risks. Hospital sites are busy places and it's actually not always easy to find a place when you can safely take off and land. You need to make sure that it remains at a safe distance from people and obstacles that are not involved with the operation. So you may want to consider rooftops. You may want to consider access to the uh, area with uh, you know, a secure smart card system. You may also want to consider CCTV feed so that you can um, have a feedback to the remote pilot, but also you can have a, um, a real-time feed for the inspection of the medical payload. And there are other different types of uh, um, items that you must consider when when integrating in real life into a hospital, a drone operation. I will highlight the final point. People do not necessarily think about it, but it's important to consider how you will communicate with the public and the different communities and stakeholders around you, even before doing a flight trial, so that you know stakeholders around you are aware of what will be happening. And finally, you know, another point that we do not always consider, uh, but it is also related to communication, is that it's important to uh, clearly plan everything around worst case scenarios and emergency planning. Because, I mean, obviously it's required to get approvals, but also your end users, you know, the management teams, the doctors and the public, they will want to know that you know how to deal with adverse conditions. In another project, we made a survey of perception of uh, uh, you know, medical drone deliveries and the feedback was extremely positive in terms of the benefit of having that service um, uh, developed uh, to support better healthcare outcomes. And at the same time, people wanted to, you know, reassurance that it was properly planned um, in case there were, you know, bad weather conditions. What if the medical payload um, becomes available to the public. So it's important to really uh, carefully plan emergency situations so that you can deal with it and so that the communication is extremely clear that you are dealing with all the different aspects of the operations. So I've been uh, rushing through the slides uh, to make sure that we have a sufficient time for questions and answers. So, you know, I hope that um, this was uh, nevertheless clear enough to you. And with, uh, with that in mind, you know, I will uh, stop the sharing and be open to uh, uh, questions from, from the audience. Annalise, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, and, I, and I must apologise. I sent a couple of messages out to to, to members of our networks, to, to Charles and, and Hubert. Switch everything back on now, because this is the point to interact. But there was just a little bit of feedback from your microphones that I that, that, that we just picked up on. Um, so I've got I've got one question from Tom here, um, and then we've got a, a, a nice bit of praise from Didi, which is just fantastic. So Tom, do you, do you want to un un unmute yourself and ask your question? It's put me on the spot. I'll put you on the spot, <laughs> haven't I? Fantastic. Hi, Annalise. Yeah, yeah, no, inter interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, there's lots of issues here, really. And I think the more you delve into it, the more the more difficult you you realise the practical realities of doing this are going to be. So, I mean, I think did you have you uh, 
we've obviously been looking at this vibration issue and we've been working on it right now with Paul actually but have, have you come across this in any way and, and and maybe people's lack of appreciation the fact that the MHRA are not going to you know probably give any drone manufacturer any rights to move anything anywhere until they can prove that their platform and probably 95 percent chance it won't make any difference but what is the vibration profile of their platform and in what ways might that impact on different drugs is that something that people are kind of wary of potentially as an issue I think that uh, the uh, drone manufacturers that are uh, specializing into medical drone delivery as one of their key market are, uh, are aware of it. Um, and, I th and I think they are working on it, but um, uh, I think it's going to be a journey in a way. The first, um, uh, the first thing is to be aware of it and then uh, doing the uh, trials and, and doing the um, you know, the testing like a Paul is doing to measure those vibrations and then remedy it. Uh, so uh, I, th I think the answer is, n it, I think it's going to be a process and the answers are not there yet. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Annalise, I've got one question about the accepted quantities and I guess I should know more more about this but i'll be I, I don't are these are these specific amounts uh, as a case by case basis or are there kind of particular recommendations like bands of of accepted quantities for pharmaceuticals so uh, you know the uh, pharmaceutical products that are medicines toxic solid or liquid um can be transported in accepted quantities and then the levels, the thresholds, depend on their sub-packing group. So uh, you have to go one step further and yeah. look, look at their sub-packing group, and then it's E1, E2, E3, E4. And depending on that, you can look, look up at the, um, at the maximum uh, quantities that can be transported. Absolutely. So it's a case by case, and it's is it cytotoxic? Is it a compressed gas? Is it or is it is it is it a, a liquid? Um, is it a bio? Yeah, that uh, that that makes a, a lot of a lot a lot of sense. So, Annalise, would you? I've got a question here. Um, I think this is from DD. Is this your question, DD? I haven't got a, a little. Yes, a little... It's mine. Does Brilliant. it not see my name DD. there? Oh. <laughs> Annalise, what a great presentation! That was so well presented and. Um, uh, and I, I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, this is a thing of mine. I'm wondering if you agree that in order to kind of build that acceptance, it, it, it is kind of social acceptance in a way amongst uh, amongst NHS providers, that it's critical to start demonstrators with really low risk payloads, payloads and then kind of build to... Um, build to risk, riskier, riskier cargo. Yeah, I fully agree. I think uh, it's important to prove first and to show uh, and starting with a relatively low risk profile. And once we have uh, proven the regularity, uh, especially it's not just a one off, it's the fact that we can demonstrate on a regular basis that the operations you know, happen uh, safely and are, um, uh, between, between hospital sites then, I think we can move on to uh, an additional layer, which is to move, for example, to transport dangerous goods. But I think it's a smart way and, and it's also the way that uh, the aviation industry has been worked, has, has been working before. So I think it's a it's fair to say that first we prove with um, a normal payload, let's put it this way, and then we can move on to dangerous goods. Great, thank you. Fantastic. Well, I think I think we're nearly up at the hour. I mean, I've just got a general point. How how is the, the SOP that you've developed and presented today? How has that been received by um, first of all the the hospital partners, the NHS trusts that you've been working with, and perhaps outside of that, has has anybody from the CAA or the MHRA had a look and commented? So the uh, feedback from the uh, NHS Trust and the medical teams we, we've been working with was very positive and also as part of the uh, air response project um, there was a, um, uh, an impact study uh, conducted um, with various uh, teams with um, Lisa of Cranfield and I think Paul you kindly um, uh, you kindly indicated some excellent contacts for, for Lisa and the feedback was actually very positive and I think it's actually 
reassuring in a way uh, to demonstrate in very plain English that the exact steps one you know step by step the exact approach that management would have to implement um, are laid out and are very easily um, accessible for everybody so operations become crystal clear in a way and that that is um, that, that, that received a very positive feedback and um, now that the project is uh, reaching completion, I will definitely share the SOP with the CAA Dangerous Goods team and, uh, and get the feedback because I'm sure that also on their end, it's a discovery. You know, they are dealing with air cargo pretty much and certainly not drones. So I'm sure that, um, you know, exchanges with, with them would be very useful. And we've just got one last question from Tom. Uh, have they asked how much such such systems will cost? So, so that sort of the healthcare partners are they worried about the cost of, of the of this service? Not not at this stage. In the sense that, um, um, in the sense that we have looked at the uh, cost savings, meaning what what does it cost to them now to have you know, uh, emergency taxi drives, uh, internal teams uh, picking up their cars or ambulances, uh, uh, driving at night to, to carry those uh, uh, lab samples. And so based on their current costs incurred, which can be in millions, we can safely say that it's all right, will fit into the economic um, envelope. But we, but we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't been down to the detailed calculation of how we would charge the service. It's mm, probably a, a, a huge amount of work that's got to go into that that next I, stage. I, th yeah. I think, I think from some of the stuff we're doing, I was, I was very positive with some of this stuff. I am becoming more skeptical. I just, I think the reality of of doing some of these services, cost wise, a lot of it is never going to be as economical as a van. It depends what setting you're in, but the harsh reality of when you look at what is airspace going to cost, how many operators, let alone the size of consignments that these things will actually be able to carry realistically. I think it's it's a really interesting area where we're going to have to do a lot more work to work out in what domains. Yeah, I think radiography discs. There's lots of there's lots of stuff where it is very appropriate, but on, on a on a wider scale, I think. The NHS may be thinking, you know, you can't get away from, unfortunately, the reality of a, a diesel van and an electric van, obviously, to replace it. But in terms of the way these samples are moved in the current commodities, particularly patient diagnostics, it's hard to see in some cases how a drone could actually not be more costly in some senses, I think. But anyway, there's a lot more to be done on that. But it's a very interesting first step. Good. Thank, thanks, Tom. And that's nicely segued into our next presenter. So, Annalise, we're, we're a minute over and I thought the discussion was fantastic and the presentation was brilliant. So thank you for that. So if I could then ask Shemek. Oh, brilliant. He's here, which is good. And um, I think some of those coping with people and and, and challenging terrain is, is going to be covered by Shemek. So the, the floor is yours, Shemek. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, Annalise, for an amazing presentation. You touched a lot of topics that uh, I'm trying to um, address and find answers to, to them. Uh, Paul could say uh, we discussed, uh, could confirm that we discussed uh, some of them uh, already, and I'm still looking for some answers. So I would be uh, love to uh, continue discussion with you and uh, get uh, some more information. And I hope that my presentation and what I'm doing will uh, answer some of your concerns, uh, approaches, um, and, uh, and the way how we think it should be done for this specific application. So let me start uh, present, uh, with my presentation. Uh, let me just, because I have three screens here, so it will be a little bit probably challenging to set it up properly, but let me try to do it. Uh, 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 uh. OK, you can see it in the full screen. We can see that fantastically well. Brilliant, thank you. Perfect. Um, so what I'm doing is uh, is creating a system. It's a startup from uh, EPFL from uh, Polytechnic in Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, we are 
creating here a new type of uh, systems uh, system that is uh, safe drone delivery system for person to person last centimeter delivery. What does it mean uh, last centimeter? It could be on a really short range, so it fulfills and it is in the group of last mile delivery, but we also call it uh, like this because we want to be very, very precise and deliver uh, very precisely and you will understand why. Uh, uh, why is that later on when I will present you uh, our products? Uh, the startup is called Dronistics, as you can see, and uh, let's start first with problems we are trying to solve and tackle. Firstly, in, in general, in urban environments, in cities, and also uh, on campuses, for example, campuses of hospitals, universities, big uh, uh, companies, there is a big problem in terms of uh, um, transportation. This uh, kind of deliveries between offices, between people is slow and is insufficient. It's not frequent enough. It's only one or twice per day and costs a lot of money. Uh, also, the high traffic and lack of infrastructure in the urban environment also is causing uh, this, these problems. This uh, not, in, not fast enough and frequent enough transportation. In total, all this is in general uh, generating huge costs. Uh, costs that we could say are more than 53% of the total cost of delivery, even if, for example, you are uh, transporting something from China, which is far, far away from Europe, this last mile delivery is more than 53% of uh, the total cost of delivery. Some of drones, drone companies are trying, uh, or not only drone companies, but logistic companies are trying to solve these problems using drones. Here you can see a few examples of the most popular um, platforms uh, like DHL, Amazon, Swiss Post with Maternet, uh, uh, Wingcopter or Zipline delivering different types of, uh, I mean, mostly uh, blood, but me medical supplies. But the problem of those platforms uh, is that they are big and bulky. They are more than 10 kilograms, uh, so they are very dangerous to fly above people. Moreover, the unprotected propellers are very, very dangerous. So that those drones have to have special landing area. Uh, sometimes it's on the top of a roof, uh, a landing space for uh, helicopters or fenced area that is uh, just uh, specially prepared for this kind of drones. What we are trying to do is we, we are trying to solve those, those problems so we, uh, by using much smaller drones, drones that have uh, uh, smaller uh, payload uh, capabilities. It's uh, up to 500 grams, but we think and believe that this is enough if, it's, uh, if we are tackling uh, frequent deliveries, fast deliveries, uh, then that could be enough to deliver just from point to point. Uh, instead of gathering all the samples and delivering once for a while. Here you can see uh, two drones. One is uh, meant to be used for delivery to a doorstep. And the second one, uh, delivery uh, for a very precise in-hand delivery, delivery to a window or a balcony. I will tell you uh, later a bit more about this. And those drones uh, are not just uh, remotely um, piloted. We developed a software, a logistic software that allows to uh, fully autonomously send these drones from a recipient, from sender to recipient and vice versa, uh, taking care of all the uh, aspects of the delivery. Starting with the first, uh, first one, the drone called Pack Drone, uh, we call it a personal delivery drone. Uh, it can deliver uh, to a doorstep because uh, we have this protective cage around the propeller, so we are safe in that way while landing between people. We will not expose uh, them to the to this danger of the fast rotating propellers. Moreover, the parcel that is inside uh, is also protected. So in case if the drone falls on the ground, then uh, the, the parcel, the payload that is uh, transported is uh, safe. Uh, the cage will be damaged first. I mean, it will absorb the energy, but uh, until a certain point it will uh, absorb it and then break, but not the goods that are inside. 
Moreover, we have a safe delivery box uh, that I will tell you a little bit more. Uh, the box that um, should absorb, as we, uh, as you discussed before, uh, that this is uh, quite a big problem, vibrations. Um, so it uh, can absorb vibrations, and what's uh, also we, we believe it's important, it can keep constant temperature during delivery. The drone can. Uh, fly uh, between buildings. Uh, it has AI on board with, and machine learning, which is basically vision based navigation that supports landing between buildings and supports GPS. Uh, as you know, between buildings, GPS can be affected. So, with the vision based navigation, we would like to support that kind of uh, landing. Uh, moreover, this system would also uh, avoid obstacles while landing. For example, if someone is passing by or a car will, uh, will, will stop. In a place where uh, we would like to land, uh, the drone will avoid this obstacle. And also, uh, we can select the most safest uh, spot to land uh, um, autonomously uh, and support the drone to land in a place where we would like to or directly in our hands, thanks to, thanks to hand gestures. So that's uh, quite uh, convenient in order to be very precise. Uh, moreover, we have a number of different um, redundant uh, systems on board, like uh, GPS, RTK GPS, parachute. Uh, recently, we started collaboration with, with Cambridge, with Paul and Patrick, where we started to understand how we can decontaminate this drone. Um, and thanks to their work, we, we know how this material uh, that is used to build this drone uh, can be decontaminated with kind of uh, liquids or, or um, methods uh, we could use uh, to do it so that if we are delivering uh, payloads to a person who might be infected, for example, uh, has, a, has a virus and uh, we are delivering testing samples or we, are, uh, we want to deliver some medication, uh, we would not expose a person who sends the drone uh, to this danger because uh, well, the, drone, the virus on the drone can come back. So we, we could we would be able to then uh, decontaminate the drone and that also will be possible uh, to do thanks to the, the fact that the drone is water resistant. So not only we could decontaminate with liquids like alcohol, but we can uh, fly during rain. The drone is personal drone because we can, as you can see on this video, I hope you it it, uh, it works for you. Uh, we can just fold this whole cage uh, and the drone that is integrated with the cage with the one single hand movement, which uh, reduces its storage volume by 92%. It's very convenient because we can either you know just keep it in an office. It does not take a lot of space. It, it fits on a shelf or in a drawer. Uh, and that's very, very convenient, or you just put it in a backpack and take uh, with you to the place of deployment. As you could see here, yeah, it, it, it fits nicely in a drawer. So it's a very nice, convenient solution for uh, this kind of operation when you are delivering close to people. But uh, during one of the events that I, uh, I, I've been presenting this drone, I understand that uh, not all of the uh, locations are safe enough. Uh, for different uh, people, for example, when we have children around, uh, they mostly want to uh, just play with the drone, catch it, and those um, small little fingers uh, could be easily hurt by such a drone. So from that point, then I started to develop a drone, as you can see, which is uh, which has a very dense cage, uh, and uh, and fingers of four year old uh, child would not gonna go through this grid. Uh, it has been done to fly directly to your hands so you can really grab it it can uh, deliver directly to a window or a balcony uh, this is a first drone of a kind no one else before did that because there is a big problem with this uh, dense grid this grid basically very much increase drag which is very problematic for a uh, payload for lift and for a uh, range of flight but I solved this problem with this uh, innovative solution, as you would see in a second, through doors that are placed around the cage and uh, morphing uh, arms. Uh, the arms and the propellers and motors are just uh, deployed through those doors and they go out. So 
basically the drone is very safe while uh, taking off and landing, by, but during cruise, so uh, flying on a longer distance from point A to point B, it's fully efficient because uh, nothing is uh, affecting the airflow. So we have very clear, nice airflow and uh, that makes it very uh, efficient and we could uh, basically use full capabilities of such a drone. Here you can see this kind of uh, this, this scenario where we just uh, with the um, propellers inside the cage uh, take off and land and then during the cruise it's, uh, it has deployed uh, propellers. Additionally, as you can see, um, here the parcel is placed on top of the drone, so uh, this allows us to put different sizes of uh, parcels. We say it's super sized parcels because they are much bigger even than the drone size, the drone dimension. Uh, uh, normally you put the parcel uh, below uh, the drone and between the propellers, which really limits uh, its size. With this solution, we don't have it. There's uh, basically uh, we could say in terms of size, no limit to put a drone. Of course, there are some other challenges like, you know, uh, drag, uh, which uh, comes from those big parcels, um, but we are trying to also uh, deal with that and solve that problems uh, with additional systems. Uh, also, the, the drone, uh, when it is folded, reduces its storage volume by 55%, which is convenient to, uh, to take uh, around with you uh, or store it just in an office. As you can see, the drone can deliver directly to a window and can be caught by a, by a person that just stands in a, in a window and the dimension fits to most of the mm, sizes of, of windows. Uh, so that's quite convenient to, to use and operate. In terms of this uh, safe parcel, because we want to deliver different uh, types of biological samples, so we developed together with a uh, in collaboration with the uh, University of Arizona in the US, we developed a special container that uh, can keep uh, constant temperature. This is one of the first um, prototypes. We have another one. I should uh, replace those photos, but um, in the container, firstly, it's a carbon. Uh, the, the first layer is a carbon uh, fiber tube that uh, is uh, mm, separating the inside uh, container. Uh, which uh, we here could uh, reduce vibrations and it's uh, more uh, resilient for to, to crash. Uh, it's much uh, safer in that way. And this container allows us to keep uh, temperature. So it has a, a heater and a set of sensors. Uh, in uh, operations where we are flying, especially be below zero, which is the most problematic case where uh, samples could be uh, damaged in low temperatures and especially those or samples or medication or whatever you see here, uh, examples of uh, items. Uh, if they have to be kept in a special temperature, then we can set uh, one of those three or any basically type. We can set up uh, any type of um, temperature that could be uh, used as is required by um, different types of payloads. And in that way, we are able to then deliver uh, it really from hands to hands, from people to people. We do not, uh, because we can just take this container from uh, external container, we just take it uh, directly uh, to, to a person that uh, is transporting, in, transporting it inside a building without need of, you know, like the drone comes back, then uh, there, is no, uh, there is no problem. Uh, it can be kept and re replaced easily. Another set of uh, uh, challenges that we are, we were trying to solve here is this uh, logistic is solved by logistic software. We developed something that can be operated, can be used on any type of um, device, uh, smartphone, tablet, laptop, because it's a web application. So uh, on uh, any web browser, you can just launch it. Uh, it's a software that can uh, monitor and track the whole flight uh, while you are sending uh, items between uh, people. So it has a special uh, interface for a uh, sender and the recipient. Uh, we can then uh, define uh, paths of flight. It could uh, define uh, mm, flight paths by itself if it will be uh, possible and allowed by uh, regulators. 
Uh, moreover, we are communicating with the use space uh, with the unmanned traffic management system. This means that we are uh, informing about our path of flight and our uh, operation, our mission at the time when we want to fly to all the other flight uh, operators around us. The system then tells us based on uh, information that it gathers uh, about all the um, agents in the air, if we can fly or we uh, can't fly because there is someone else. Moreover, the system also verifies uh, uh, weather and here we, we know if it's uh, too windy, uh, too windy for such platform or it's uh, uh, there is an icing problem because uh, it's raining and the and temperature is uh, that low that we could uh, generate the icing, um, weather would generate icing conditions basically. Uh, everything is in real time, so you see where the drone is, how it flies, when it starts, the recipient is informed about the, the start of flight, and the recipient can define where the drone should basically land. Is it in front of a building, behind, in a garden, on top of a roof? The decision, uh, we put the decision on the, in the hands of, of a recipient because they know where the drone should uh, land and where they should find it. Of course, you know, like some things can be hard coded. We could define where the drones should land in, in more autonomous, uh, automatic uh, missions. Everything by the, uh, on top of that is encrypted. There is no chance to, to get into the system. So uh, no one basically uh, can know who is using it. But we have uh, also uh, an option to define who is using the system at uh, which time, because uh, you have to, to both uh, sender and user app, you have to log in uh, after, of course, registering uh, inside the system. Uh, so far, I told you about mostly uh, urban environments we, where we were uh, flying and where we would like to fly, but also I uh, did a pilot project in very remote area in, an, uh, in, a, in the mountains of the Dominican uh, Republic where we were flying and we were trying to understand how in those remote areas we can actually support uh, local communities or uh, doctors, uh, nurses uh, by delivering on short range um, medication and uh, different types of tools that are required. I let you uh, watch this uh, this video uh, and after that, if there is something missing, I will just uh, add what was uh, another goal, but please, please watch it and I hope you that the voice uh, it will be heard by you. <laughs> Shemek, I think we can see the pictures really well. Was there a sort of a commentary to go with it? Because like we yes, can't hear. That, that's why I was. Uh, is, is, can you hear a voice or not? No. D uh, do you want to do it yourself? Is yeah, yes, I can do that. Uh, maybe if I if I increase the the voice here, would you be able to hear it or or not? Let just uh, let's uh, let's try. see. Can you hear anything? No. no, I'm afraid not. OK, so uh, if, in that case, then I can comment on top of it. Uh, that would be uh, also <laughs> easy, easy for me. Uh, just uh, we'll mute here so that I'm not uh, disturbed by the, by the um, voice. Uh, we went to the mountains of Dominican Republic because we wanted to try um, to see, uh, to, to make a pilot project, but understand uh, basically what kind of uh, deliveries we could do there. As you can see, uh, the, there is uh, very high vegetation. There are some 
mountains around. It's very hard. There is not a really uh, well uh, road infrastructure uh, in that um, area. So it's very hard to move from point to point. Even going from, you know, like uh, uh, on the map, uh, 500 meters uh, takes like two hours because you have to go down through, uh, through this high vegetation, etc. So it was very, very challenging. Uh, the idea was here that uh, in these areas, there are a lot of different pharmacies and hospitals that are located, but uh, the big problem is that we, um, we, I mean, doctors that uh, are uh, working there, uh, visiting local communities and go to the, those most uh, sick patients. Uh, and they don't, because as you see, the, the, the problem with the environment, it's hard to really go uh, and, and reach all those areas and all those places in this area. So uh, they don't want to carry all this equipment with them. Uh, on their back and they would like to have just those things that they would like uh, they would they need the most in a in a such area uh, here you could see that uh, even a child could operate uh, a drone I will tell you a comment on that in a second so the idea is that you know whoever is in a hospital and pharmacy like a nurse can just put uh, in an easy way whatever a doctor uh, needs and then send it directly to the place uh, this is the top of the roof of a, um, of a clinic that was uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, we were able to send it to, uh, to people who are living around. For example, uh, this small uh, child was a grand uh, uh, child of, of, uh, of a grandma uh, who basically helped her to, to operate because uh, uh, grandma has uh, problems with heart, so she needs uh, medication uh, to, to receive uh, quite often. Uh, and in that way, uh, basically, they could uh, receive this medication even if there is a problem uh, when they cannot move and get to the hospital. And uh, it was very easy to operate by even a, a small child. So that's uh, the, what we want to show and, and present in such a scenario. Uh, that's basically, you know, like a, a one of the pilot projects that we we uh, made. Uh, above uh, all this, we are planning uh, additional pilot projects and uh, and uh, operations. So, I would like to uh, show it to you in the future. Uh, now, just to quickly summarize, uh, can you hear? Can you hear me still? Yep, all good, Chemek. OK, so to summarize, our vision our, uh, and our goals are to lower the cost of the delivery. Uh, we say that the cost could be uh, like 10 cents per kilometer. We would like to increase speed of delivery uh, and uh, basically deliver stuff, deliver uh, payloads, medication, biological samples, uh, any time when uh, it is uh, needed to, to deliver something. Uh, our goal is to make it very uh, in a very safe manner, taking into account all the risks that uh, uh, go along with the um, with drone deliveries. And also, we would like to be very, very uh, easy to use. So a very simple system that uh, just deploys in a few seconds. You deploy the drone, you connect the battery, put payload uh, on it and just register to or log in to our system, our logistic software. And with uh, basically three clicks, you can uh, send the drone to a proper location or receive the goods that you need. At the end, uh, those are the, the, the topics basically uh, that I would like to basically discuss, mention, but Anli is uh, already uh, described a lot of uh, those challenges. So for example, uh, uh, what are the applications? What kind of uh, things we would like to in terms of medical delivery? What what kind of biological samples we could deliver? Um, what kind of medication? Is it for search and rescue or for like daily delivery between a, a collecting point of those biological samples to the testing location or delivering directly to people? What are the payloads? Because, you know, we mostly talk about uh, yeah, the in general delivery of medication or different types of medical uh, supplies. 
but uh, it would be nice to, to, for example, define what exactly could be delivered, uh, what are these uh, this things, sizes, weights, how fast they have to be delivered, how, what are the regulations. Some of those, those um, questions were already addressed in the previous presentation, which I was very happy to, to hear about. Uh, to listen to that uh, presentation and also locations and, and applications. You know, are the campuses, remote areas? Uh, someone would like to have it, uh, would have a delivery to a window or a balcony. For example, one of the hospitals here in, in Lausanne uh, asked us for such a um, application for such a such a service because the problem they have in hospitals. I don't know if you agree with that, but mostly for them is uh, the time that uh, takes the most to deliver uh, samples between a testing location, a testing point uh, and the point where the samples are collected is the need to basically go through the whole hospital through a building. Uh, all the corridors uh, are uh, uh, mostly overwhelmed. They are uh, busy, crowded, uh, elevators are uh, have priority for patients, not for a, an office boy who is uh, delivering samples. So all this takes a lot of time. So their requirement was uh, to basically just open a window in the place where the samples are tested, put it on a drone and send it also to another window where they are just tested. That would, they said that that would be the ideal case for them in order to speed up the process of uh, uh, testing uh, different biological samples. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for listening to me. I hope there will be uh, questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm free to to start the session. Fantastic, Shemik. We've, we've got to the end of time, but I'm sure we can squeeze um, five minutes discussion. Um, and um, as there's quite a lot of questions, I'm going to just dive in and ask them on behalf of the questionnaires. Um, so uh, Deirdre Didi's asked a, a question. She's from Oxford County Council. Have there been any concerns raised about potential for misuse, sort of illicit drug transportation? So somebody buys your technology and does bad things with it. Yes, of course, we were thinking about that as well, because, you know, they. Uh, as everything can be used in a good way and a bad way, so uh, whatever you know, you can either uh, you know like deliver drugs or a gun or whatever. So uh, we are we are thinking, yeah, yeah that's how we know. Uh, <laughs> we, we we even concerned that this, those kind kind of things could happen. So uh, there are also when within this logistic software, we want to track uh, who is using it, when is using it, and even. Uh, uh, and even uh, allow if this would be uh, required to uh, collaborate with uh, specific units of, of police or whatever. I mean, this all this has to be somehow regulated. There should be procedures. Not everyone should be using it. I think uh, just you know, like right away. Yeah. Um, you know, like so, like common sense and regulations, and you know, like and also fear. As everything uh, we we have, like you know, we leave our expensive cars on the um, on the road, right? And uh, we believe that no one will gonna rob, steal uh, uh, our car because we know that for this uh, act, someone can go to a jail, right? So the same way of thinking should be introduced, I think, uh, to people that, that drones are not toys; they are used for specific actions that are very important for, uh, for example, uh, people's lives, right? Good. And, and perhaps you know, the, the car analogy is quite good, perhaps like a, a sort of a, a digital number plate for each of the drones, perhaps, or something like that. So people, yeah, I've got to be really quick. There's some fantastic questions here. Um, Alex from from Neuron, um, are you working on strategies for complex airspace or very much rural uh, quiet operations? Well, I think you're doing both, aren't you, Shemek? You're doing both rural and urban, aren't you? Yes, rural rural environments are very easy to 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 work. Uh, the the urban ones are much more complex, but we are uh, focusing right now on the urban ones. So then, you know, like mode would be very easy. So uh, we are going through the um, SORA, through the procedure to prepare SORA in a city uh, center uh, with Biblos flight. So uh, we we hope that it will gonna go through and we will be able to fly soon. 
and it's got a follow on question, which is quite technical, actually. Also, when you say 10 lowercase c per kilometer, does that include capex or simply opex? So, uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've probably mispronounced that. So it's C A P A E X or simply O P E X. OK, so I don't know exactly what uh, uh, the, what someone wanted to know in this yeah. question, but basically what we uh, what we believe is that if we work with hospitals, uh, maybe a bit more direct answer uh, could be done in a way that uh, we can we provide the service. So it's not that uh, we sell the system because that would be easier for like you know, CapEx. So basically we we don't want to uh wait for a decision of high uh top I mean, level ma managers to buy the system and convince them about that but uh, from uh, some operations and some collaborations i have i know that there are some money that are used for this already for transportation so instead of uh, transportation of biological samples or some services so instead of that we could basically use this uh, gotcha. those drones for uh, such uh, operations so either we can charge it for by kilometer or we can charge it by uh, by a number of months that the service is uh, used and is provided. Uh, the minimum amount of months to be really sure that uh, some the client knows how it would work would be, for example, six months. But it shouldn't be a lot of uh, a lot of money. It, it would it would be acceptable, I think, uh, by the management. Hmm. I've got a I've got a follow on question now. Um, Charles asks. Um, is the temperature control payload container available on the market? No, not yet. yet no, we, we are still working on that. Uh, and we would like to, we would love to actually know what you would like to deliver. So all those questions that I had in the, at the end, I would love to start any kind of collaboration and discussion that are related with what we would like to, what we could uh, deliver. Because for this, um, then we could adjust these containers. We could make it as as they um, they should be how for number of samples for different temperatures, etc. Uh, etc. Et no, like I would love to if if you have any kind of this you know any of this information available or you you have some concrete uh, application, yeah, please let I, me know. Contact with me. I, I know that Charles does fantastic stuff, so he I think he'll be able to give you a, a, some really good specifications. So um, I know you've put it in your presentation, but in the chat, do you want to, Shemek, do you want to put some of your contact details so that so because that, that 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 that'll be quite a specific offline <laughs> conversation, isn't it? Um, I'm going to ignore my questions because of time, and there's some very good questions. So while you're doing that, uh, Ewan from Flight Crew. Um, What's the maximum takeoff weight for your newer, um, your caged drone? Uh, the one that is foldable? Yes. I mean, basically both uh, at the moment, uh, the maximum takeoff weight is two and a half kilo. So which is below four kilos, which is uh, easier to, to then get an authorization. Yeah. But uh, the version two of the payload of this cage drone that folds uh, would have eight propellers, which uh, would increase the, the distance of delivery uh, twice and that would be below uh, four kilos three and a half fantastic and Bonnie's come up with a, with a, with a brilliant question at the end um uh, Deirdre's saying she's got to go because we, we, we're, we're five minutes over but the questions are just fantastic so we'll finish up with uh, uh, with Bonnie's um what is your ROI or volume of deliveries to cover the business model so how many deliveries what frequency do you do you expect to cover your uh, and this is this is a very good question at the end and and basically it's the very the, this is the biggest problem that we have <laughs> because uh, we should have a lot of deliveries or a lot a lot of systems sold uh, and the the biggest challenge right now uh, is not who would like to use it because a lot of people would like to use it, a lot of clients we we would have uh, if regulations are um, allowing us to do it yeah. because everyone knows and sees that it's not that easy. We have to prepare SODA for basically almost a uh, path flight and define you know, the CONOPS and everything that is you know like related with the mission. So that is basically slowing out the whole process. Yeah, cool. Good. So I think 
on that point, I think we're there. So we're, we're a few minutes over, but that doesn't matter because the presentations were fantastic. And with your permission, I've asked already, but we're going to put everything onto um, uh, the uh, YouTube channel so people can go and view that. And we do get quite a few views over the month, which is good. I think I think Bonnie's just making she's, she's agreeing with your with your response there, <laughs> which is good. Yes. Yeah, so Bonnie, to, uh, to tell you, I mean, we, we want to start with services because I mean, I agree with you that it's hard, but uh, but it, it's also a little bit easier to convince this high level management to start with because then if they see how uh, it works then they will be um, much easier um, willing to allocate money in the next year budget to to make it work and to to buy the system uh, but you know like for us it's very hard to reach uh, basically management or hospital saying that well, buy this for that much of money, and they are like, ah, we don't know how it would work, what it is. So it's uh, always the same game. So when when we say that, yeah, let's stay with service, you don't have to buy, you just pay us for a amount of time. Then they say, okay, that 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 works better. Yeah, but it puts the onus on you for the full upfront funding versus a capex model, and those two models are very diverse. I guess is what my point was. I agree with you. I agree with you. So you know, depends for whom. It's you know, like for hospitals, it kind of it looks like it it works with services, but not for everyone. So it will be adjusted according to basically who is the client. I'm, I'm going to ask, I shouldn't ask my own question, but I'm going to anyway, Shemek, just to clock. I've got a question, and the, uh, this, well, there's one that's pop, pop, popped in. That's, oh, no. Oh, people are saying they've got, they've got to go. Um, just very quickly, insurance and indemnity, because it looks like you're very close to actual actual regular missions with your, with your te te technology. How do you insure it? We have to talk with uh, with companies who would like to work on that, and it depends also where and who wants to, because not all of the insur uh, insurance companies want to uh, provide the services right now. Uh, now, I, now, for example, in Switzerland, this is uh, possible, available. It's easy. It's one of the standard services that you can basically insure uh, drone flights for even a lot of money. But in some companies, those some companies, sorry, some some um, countries, this service is not yet even pr provided. And if you even want to have something. It's not yet within the you know, set of services, so you know I think it will gonna come at a certain point, and you know like it will be as a standard procedure, standard service. I was just just thinking with your app, it would make sense to get an insurance company to come in on your app because you, you could insure per. I mean, I for my amateur drone flights, I use the flock thing where you can you can book an hour and it and it gives you a rate depending on the the, the weather, the conditions, and the location, which which works an absolute treat. Um, I could talk for for ages, but um, we've all got to go back and do our regular jobs now. So so thank you very much, Shemek, and thank you very much, Annalise. Hopefully, Annalise is still there. You're getting lots of nice thank yous and well done in the in, in the chat, both of you, which is good. I'm now going to switch off the recording, and then if you give me a day.